your welcome. And um, the um, reports of the demise of Christianity are often, always, greatly exaggerated. Um, I, I, I don't know what uh, we might say about the European Union, but we should see. Um, the way in which I'm going to approach this topic uh, will be different, of course, from uh, the other speakers, I expect, and it may even be different from how you expect things uh, to turn out this afternoon. But just bear with me as I develop my argument. And I think the first thing that uh, struck me when I was invited to speak here was that um, when appeals are made to European civilization, uh, as they often are in promoting the European Union, indeed the Church of England itself was doing precisely that uh, at the time that uh, Stuart was mentioning, uh, these appeals uh, are uh, to a great extent anachronistic because of course uh, the civilization to which they appeal, classical civilization, uh, was not uh, limited to the northwest end of the Eurasian Peninsula. Uh, classical civilization, as you know, was spread over three continents. Uh, what we now call Europe, of course, um, uh, southwestern Asia, and uh, northern Africa. And this is uh, worth remembering because I think it has relevance uh, for how uh, we should see uh, the future of Europe. George Weidel in his book develops this argument uh, very well. So there is uh, an anachronism. I mean, Europa, the legend of uh, Europa itself was the kidnapping of the daughter of uh, a king in what is now Lebanon, Taha, the king of Taha, uh, by Zeus uh, and her seduction in Crete. Um, so um, you already have this uh, connection, as it were, uh, amongst Mediterranean lands, <coughs> east and west. Uh, but um, uh, this uh, anachronism, if you like, of restricting uh, European civilization to one corner, as it were, of the ancient world, uh, this is uh, complemented, I suppose is the word, uh, with arrival, the arrival of ideas in uh, the, but Southern Europe certainly, but what we, uh, what we now call Europe, and particularly uh, moral and spiritual ideas uh, and practices. Uh, so Bishop Lightfoot, uh, in his uh, excellent excursus on the relationship between St. Paul and Seneca, points out that uh, the, the moral fervor certainly the moral fervor of the Stoics, was due to the oriental uh, influence and indeed origin of many uh, Stoic ideas. Um, this uh, reminded me of the assertion sometimes made by the Church Fathers uh, that, uh, perhaps exaggerated, but with certainly a germ of truth in them, that uh, many of the moral ideas of the Greek thinkers actually had their origin in Moses. They were a borrowing from Moses, therefore, uh, from the Bible. Uh, if we are talking about arrivals, then the arrival of an itinerant preacher from Troy, well, coming from Troy, he, wasn't, he was from much further east, of course, uh, but he left from Troy to arrive uh, in Philippi, in Macedonia is of um, crucial importance to the history of uh, Europe. Um, and of course by that I mean the arrival of St. Paul. Uh, <clears throat> Pope Benedict uh, called this uh, a turning point, uh, not only in European history but in world history, because it changed everything forever. And it is the obstinate uh, refusal of the architects of the European Union uh, to uh, recognize and to accommodate this fact that has struck me uh, as very odd in itself. Um, but these uh, arrivals culminating in the arrival of Christianity uh, in Europe, uh, this uh, fertilized cross-fertilization of Jerusalem 
with Athens, with the developing by Christianity of what Benedict also called purified Hellenism. Purified Hellenism. Um, as I say, uh, responsible for so many uh, incredible moral and spiritual uh, changes on the map of what we now call Europe. Um, I mean, one of the first things uh, that Christianity did was to challenge the widespread practice of usually female infanticide. You see, uh, the killing of unwanted children. Well, that's still going on under another name, as, as we all know, uh, of course. And uh, you may remember uh, 18 months ago there was an article in the journal, uh, in a medical journal here in this country, uh, describing something called post-birth abortion. Well, that is what Christians were against. Um, how quickly slavery came to an end in this country uh, and also elsewhere in Europe after the arrival of Christianity. I mean, Anselm declared it uh, unchristian, uh, Archbishop of Canterbury. Um, and, of course, the ending of the games. You know, we are becoming once again a bread and circuses culture, aren't we? We can't survive without some games going on somewhere at some time. Uh, but the, the ending of the games was the ending of a feature of, of Roman civilization particularly, uh, which took pleasure in cruelty. So, um, uh, these um, arrivals were hugely significant in shaping what, what was to become Western civilization. Um, but there was, of course, uh, an immediate uh, assault. No sooner had Christian ideas uh, begun to, to take root uh, and uh, to change culture, to change values, there was the eruption, as you know, of the barbarian invasions. Um, arising in those parts of what we now call Europe, uh, that had not uh, really come under the influence of either Roman uh, or Greek civilization. Um, and the eruption, as it were, of the Germanic tribes and the destruction in the west of the Roman Empire. Now, uh, this could have been the end of any European project whatsoever, actually, um, if it had not been for Christianity. Of course, the Eastern Roman Empire survived uh, for several centuries until it was overtaken by Islam. That's another story, uh, perhaps a relevant story for us uh, today. Um, but in the West, certainly, um, it was uh, the Christian Church and the Christian faith that made it possible for civilization to survive at all after these great eruptions uh, that took place. And the, uh, the point that I would want to make uh, this afternoon is that the contribution that Christianity made was different in different places with different peoples. It was not monolithic. Um, so, uh, for instance, uh, there was, first of all, um, perhaps uh, paralleling uh, what is happening with the European Union, the emergence of what came to be called the Holy Roman Empire. Uh, Charlemagne, uh, the way in which he organized uh, his people, how he extended his territory, so that eventually uh, Leo III uh, had to recognize him uh, in some way, and uh, he was uh, given the title of Holy Roman Empire, uh, Emperor. Uh, and um, uh, this was an attempt to uh, restore in the West some notion of a unified civilization. Um, Charlemagne, of course, was very interested in the uh, Christian aspect of this um, and uh, made very sure that Christian moral and spiritual ideas informed 
the uh, emergence and the development of his empire. I mean, the merits and demerits of that uh, perhaps we can go into later on, but this was one way in which the rebuilding, uh, as it were, began to take place. But the other was uh, the uh, emergence in places like Italy and Switzerland of city-states. You know, not the monolith of the empire, as it were. Not Christianity imitating the Roman Empire. Uh, who was it who said of the Holy Roman Empire that it was neither holy nor Roman nor an empire? Uh, who was it? Voltaire. Uh, was it Voltaire? Oh, I would explain Voltaire if you say that. But uh, the city-states were quite different. I mean, uh, they, uh, the, uh, one of the catalysts in the emergence of the city-states, it seems, was the presence of a bishop in them. Um, I mean, bishops have their uses. Uh, but I expected that it was, it was not just the individual, the bishop as an individual, uh, but as representing an institution uh, that promoted literacy, music, building, uh, other civilizational values. But then the third is the unique instance of England. So England, um, at first anyway, perhaps until Henry VIII, did not develop as an empire, in the sense of the Holy Roman Empire, nor as a uh, collection of city-states. But from the very beginning had a quite centralized understanding of itself. Uh, and the reason, uh, for this, well, there are a number of people who are, uh, who are the reason for this. Uh, two individuals who both came from outside, actually, who provided for something of the unification of the English people. I mean, if you read Bede's uh, history, uh, which is a history of the people and not just of the church, uh, the two he identifies are Hadrian the African and Theodore, Archbishop of Canterbury, who, of course, also came funnily enough, from Tarsus. Uh, you know, so another arrival, as it were, like, like St. Paul. But uh, uh, the, uh, the unifying of the church, the gathering of the disparate elements of English Christianity by these two, uh, the Synod of Whitby, the creation of the parochial system, the beginnings of the creation of the parochial system, uh, the beginning of uh, provision for education, See, education was, for a long time, provided by the church and not by the state. I mean, the state is a, is a very late comer to the business of universal education. Um, and so when people ask about church schools, I think the very least we can say is we were here first, uh, by quite a long way. Uh, anyway, this um, resulted in this sense of unity of the English people, of the development of forms of government um, and, uh, um, and an identity, I suppose, one, uh, one has to say. So the, uh, the rebuilding uh, inspired by Christianity was not monolithic, is what, that's, my, that's one of my theses. And then, uh, wherever it took place, it seems to me that there were two poles to it. There was what you might call the top-down rebuilding. Uh, you know, uh, I don't know if you can build from the top down, but uh, uh, this did happen. Um, which had to do uh, with um, society being organized according uh, to Christian ideas. So the Christian doctrine of God God, the Holy Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit uh, was hugely influential in this because here there is both order and mutuality. Uh, the Son is not the Father. The Holy Spirit is neither the Father nor the Son. So there is order in the Blessed Trinity but also a mutuality. The, uh, the Son loves the Father, the Father loves the Son. Uh, the Holy Spirit, uh, as Augustine said, is the relationship of love amongst them, between them. Um, and uh, this brought about uh, a society uh, which was based, uh, of 
course on divine law, uh, come to that in a moment, but also a recognition of natural law and of human positive law, but which reflected uh, both order and interdependence. Uh, mutual obligation was recognized, in other words. Uh, it was not a society where people stood on their rights, uh, but where they recognized their obligation to their neighbor. Um, now, of course, people misused uh, this sense of interdependence and of order for their own uh, interests. I do not in any way deny that, but uh, simply to recognize it. Secondly, it was uh, a society that took seriously the importance of the Ten Commandments. Uh, I've been doing a, a study of the Ten Commandments, actually, uh, for some teaching purposes later on. And um, it was Alfred, I think, in this case, uh, King Alfred, who, when he was devising the common law, what came to be known as the common law tradition, uh, made sure that the different elements of the laws of the different peoples in his kingdom uh, when they were being synthesized into this common law were always uh, consonant with the teaching of the Bible and particularly of the devil. Now in, in America, as you may know, uh, people are busily removing the devil law from courtrooms. Well, you can do that, but you cannot uh, remove the basis for law as it came to be of the common law tradition. You can't remove that. You can't deny what people can deny history, but I think they're very unwise to do so. And then the, the third main idea in this top-down building, if you like, uh, of polity uh, in Europe was the idea of the godly ruler. That the ruler is as much accountable uh, for what he or she does um, as anyone else. And this continues to be reflected in our coronation service, where almost one of the first promises that the monarch has to make is to uh, promote obedience of uh, the laws of God and the true profession of the gospel. You see that? I mean, if you're looking for a basis of the, of the constitution in this country, that's quite a good place to begin. So there was the top-down movement, but there was also a bottom-up movement. Uh, and it is here that we encounter again and again uh, the expression made in God's image. So the idea of the fundamental dignity of the human person, the freedom, limited but nevertheless real, of the human person, uh, the power of agency, all of this had to do uh, with being made in God's image. Um, and um, from this uh, came uh, two things that became very important, remain very important today. The first was the importance of conscience. That if this person is uh, really free, then conscience becomes very important because how you act makes a difference in the world around you, to yourself, and to other people. And the other idea was that of consent. That however God-given and providential the political and social order might be, it is not legitimate until it has the consent of those who are governed by it. I mean, again, as you can see, this is a, this is a fundamental idea. That, um, uh, in the civilization that was to emerge. Interestingly enough, um, it uh, had another life, if you like, uh, across the ocean. Because uh, when Europeans began to arrive in the Americas, uh, the question arose about the status of the indigenous people. And there were, of course, many people then um, who were uh, quite content to deny any status to the indigenous people. Uh, that helped them in, uh, in the removal of those people, in taking their lands and using them in forced labor and all of those things that undoubtedly happened. A 
against this uh, stood out many Christian leaders. I have in mind uh, the Bishop in Mexico, Bishop Bartolome Las Casas, who said, no, uh, this cannot be done because these people are also made in God's image. Therefore, they also have rights to property. They also have family uh, rights and obligations. They have a right to earn their living. They have the right to mobility and, and so on. <clears throat> this debate uh, got back to Europe through the Dominican University of Salamanca uh, and the work of people like Francisco uh, Vittoria uh, against those who believe not in natural freedom but in natural slavery following Aristotle. You see, I mean, uh, Greek democracy is not all it's trumpeted to be, and it would be very unsafe for us to base ourselves on it. It was very selective, very exclusive, uh, and very often degenerated into oligarchy. Um, the point is that this discussion, which was really a Dominican discussion for a long time, was picked up by some of the moderate enlightenment. And I think we must distinguish between the moderate and the radical enlightenment. Sorry, I had a glass of water here. What did I do? You've been drinking my water. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Well, I have to drink your uh, water. Uh, um, Newton, Locke, Boyle, uh, these to me represent the moderate enlightenment, which was an attempt. Uh, to bring uh, Christian thinking to bear on a new scientific and social situation. Uh, the radical enlightenment uh, is quite different. I'll uh, come to it in a moment. Uh, but if you read John Locke, uh, he also, uh, almost word for word, uh, refers to some of the things that Las Casas and Victoria were talking about. And again, explicitly, like that, refers to the image of God. Uh, uh, this is also the case in uh, legislation today. I mean, sometimes when we are looking at uh, liminal issues that are touching on human dignity, on the sacredness of the human person, things like that, we have to appeal to transcendent principles. Uh, utilitarianism fails us at that time. So do opinion, or should do. So do opinion polls, and all that kind of thing. Now, um, um, natural rights talk, which is mutated into human rights talk, uh, of course there are very unreasonable aspects to it, as it has developed in the European Union, as you and I know. Uh, but uh, any kind of talk about the inherent dignity of the human person uh, can only be justified by reference to its Christian origins, its transcendent origins, not otherwise. Um, now this uh, rebuilding, of course, was also accompanied, as you know, by a great renewal of learning, uh, of art, of literature, uh, of law. I mean, people talk about the influence of Roman law in the development of law in, in Europe and even in parts of this country. Um, but the, the point uh, to make is that the, the Roman law that contributed to this uh, legal development was not just classical <coughs> Roman law. It was actually Roman law as mediated to us by Christians. It was Justinian and Theodosius. Uh, it was not um, without that Christian refraction, if you like. Uh, and then there was Reformation. <coughs> uh, I think we uh, have to acknowledge uh, that um, the, um, the insistence amongst the reformers uh, that the word of God should be made available to ordinary people. Uh, whatever its religious effects might be, it was one of the reasons for the spread of literacy. Um, for instance, not 
just the spread of literacy, but the virtual creation of languages like English. And um, I sometimes say that um, Shakespeare is unthinkable without Tyndale. Um, and with the way in which the English language was formed and developed because of the translation of the Bible and its widespread uh, use uh, among people, uh, becoming part, uh, therefore, of ordinary discourse. Um, now, um, I've talked about the moderate enlightenment. Many of these achievements of this recreation, of this renewal, of this rebuilding, uh, were strongly challenged by what you might call the radical enlightenment. If the moderate enlightenment drew on Christian principles, here was something different. Um, and we have to ask whether these European projects that Stuart was mentioning, to what extent are they influenced by this moderate Christian enlightenment and to what extent by the radical? It seems to me one way of reading history, um, certainly after the Second World War, is to see a move away from the moderate to the radical enlightenment. And that may be uh, part of our problem. Uh, many things can be said about the radical enlightenment, some of them not very polite, I shan't say them. Uh, but just to think, uh, I mean, you have first of all Rousseau's idea of the noble savage against the Christian idea, first of all, of the creation of human beings as a community. You see, when they're created in God's image, man and woman he made, together he made them. Together they are given their common mission. Um, so it is not, uh, there is no primal horde of Darwin's uh, and there is no noble savage. What you have from the very beginning is human society. But then also, uh, talking about the nobility bit of it, uh, the Bible also recognizes the fallen. Not just the image of God, but that uh, this image has become tarnished, uh, it has become obscured, it has been damaged, not destroyed, but certainly all of those things. And what did William Golding say? That uh, uh, he thought of human beings uh, as permeated by darkness, but somehow, even in that darkness, there is an emerging light, that redeeming light, if you like, uh, what makes it possible for us uh, to be good and not uh, radically evil. Um, <clears throat> so the noble savage idea stands against a Christian anthropology, if you like. Uh, Feuerbach saying uh, uh, that all theology was anthropology that the proper study of man is man. Um, and uh, against this, the Christian idea that man cannot be understood without reference to God. That in fact, all anthropology, all genuine anthropology is theology. Uh, otherwise, you have absurdity, irrationality, uh, a rational observing being in an irrational, directionless, and purposeless universe. In what sense does that make you? Um, the third idea, of course, is Marx's. And uh, my original objection to Marx was not his economic theories, but his historical determinism. You see, the, 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 deny, the basic denial in Marx of human freedom. And also, of course, is materialism. And Christianity stands both for the priority of the mind and the spirit and for human freedom against Marx. And then the, the fourth idea, related perhaps, uh, is the Freudian and Jungian um, interest, let us say, obsession with the self with the self and with the autonomy of the self, if you like. 
Christianity has always uh, emphasized the interdependence of human beings. Uh, but it is this obsession, therapeutic if you like, um, which is leading to the kind of narcissism that we find all around us. I was interested to read that 70% of all the pictures taken on mobile telephones are of ourselves. Selfies. Selfies, that's it, yeah, that's what they're calling it. Selfies. 70% of them. Well, that's a very nice picture of Nazi. Um, the, um, those who began uh, with the reconstruction of Europe um, were, some of them anyway, were people with a Christian vision. And, um, well, I mean, you know the names, Robert Schumann, uh, Jean Monnet, even Conrad Adenauer. And their uh, instinct was to recover the historical and cultural commonality that there is uh, because of this incredible influence uh, of the Christian faith, even in mediating the classical tradition to us. Uh, they were also concerned that Europe should not, again, never again, uh, be enrolled in the, in, in the kind of bloody wars uh, in which it had been in the first half of the 20th century. Uh, and they were concerned, of course, also for economic prosperity, for the rebuilding, the reconstruction of Europe and so forth. This is very far from the kind of super state project uh, into which it has mutated. Uh, so I'm sure the other speakers will also say this. Uh, there are uh, things about the European idea that we should affirm. Uh, that uh, there's nothing wrong with them. Living at peace with our neighbors, cooperating economically, uh, with our neighbors, um, uh, uh, celebrating uh, a common culture and the achievements of that culture, there's nothing wrong with that. But that is not a super state. And um, the super state idea is, I think, informed not by the moderate enlightenment, not by Christianity, but by the radical enlightenment. And that is why it is resulting um, in uh, certain dangers. With which you are no doubt familiar, but I just want quickly to uh, pinpoint uh, uh, what, what they are. Um, there is first of all the, the growth of this overweening bureaucracy, um, which seems not to be accountable to anyone. This goes against the Christian idea of the godly ruler, who is accountable to a moral law who is accountable uh, to other people, and of course, who is accountable to God. This bureaucracy seems to be unaccountable on every uh, side, on every front. Uh, and um, it is not just uh, that there is a bureaucracy, but there is a, an emerging bondage, if you like, a totalitarianism uh, that uh, is being given birth. Um, again and again we see uh, a restriction not just of practices uh, but of ideas. Um, so the uh, Italian uh, minister who uh, was denied confirmation as a commissioner of the European Union uh, was denied confirmation not because of something he had done or even that he said he would do, but simply because of what he thought. Um, similarly, um, hate speech laws, uh, this book called Censored by um, Robert Coleman, 
uh, is an account of how hate speech laws are restricting freedom more and more for people. So uh, the question here is not uh, whether at the European level or derivatively at the state level, whether uh, what someone has said uh, has incited people to violence or even to discrimination. That's not the question. The question is simply that they have said those things. Um, I mean, where will that end? Uh, criticism of other people, not liking their views, not liking their religion perhaps, uh, or what they wear, etc. I mean, uh, this will uh, create a very real uh, bondage, if you like, for people. More and more, the refusal by the European courts and also our domestic courts to uh, recognize um, conscience. You remember how the emergence of conscience was the result of the emphasis in this development from below of the dignity of the human person. And Britain has had a very long and honorable history of recognizing conscience in law. Conscientious objection during the war. Um, the Abortion Act is not my favorite piece of legislation, but even that recognizes conscience in certain circumstances for medical practitioners. The Human Fertilization and Embryology Act, again, not a favorite, but nevertheless it also recognizes conscience. But recent uh, legislation, equality legislation, for instance, does not make any room for conscience. And this is reflected in the decisions of both domestic uh, courts and the European court itself. Nor is there recognition of reasonable accommodation at the workplace for people's beliefs. And it is this that has resulted in a spate of uh, uh, removal from employment, dismissals, um, deregistration from professional bodies, uh, you know, all of those things. Um, that you undoubtedly know about. So the bureaucracy is leading to the bondage of totalitarianism. Uh, at particular risk, of course, are our children. Because uh, Peter Hitchens has said one of the signs of totalitarianism is when the state starts taking responsibility for our children rather than for uh, the parents to be the primary uh, people responsible for them. And um, thirdly, this uh, emergence of a super state of this kind will in the end result in barbarism because it will destroy the fundamental values that people hold uh, and it is these values that create culture, material or intellectual or literary or whatever it may be. This is, in fact, George Weigel's thesis in this uh, very suggestive book of his called The Cube and the Cathedral, uh, which is a comparison of Notre Dame with the Pompidou Institute, uh, opposite the Louvre, I think it is, uh, where he compares the featurelessness of modern and postmodern architecture with the glorious asymmetry of our cathedrals, uh, which, have been, have, which have been born out of a spiritual vision. And uh, the point that he makes is that without a spiritual and moral vision, great culture, high culture is not possible. Um, now, um, <clears throat> to finish, uh, what, what can we do in these circumstances? Um, I think the first thing is that uh, we must at all costs resist the emergence of a super state. Particularly, I think, where England is concerned, which has a long history of a completely different kind of development as a state. Uh, quite different from the rest of Europe, uh, even from the city-states, certainly from the model of the Holy Roman Empire, uh, such as it was. Uh, secondly, we must make sure that our laws continue to provide for a recognition of conscience uh, and of reasonable accommodation. 
Without this, uh, the super state will make sure that even the sort of thing that I'm saying at the moment uh, will become more and more difficult, if not impossible, to say. There have been instances of this in the last year in my own experience, uh, where, for instance, uh, Oxbridge Colleges and uh, big conference centers uh, in London uh, will not uh, host a conference on marriage if it is the traditional Christian view of marriage. So, I mean, that's the kind of thing that uh, we are facing. Um, and thirdly, and finally, finally, preachers are allowed more. Finally, um, <laughs> finally as well. Uh, but um, uh, at the at the very end, I think uh, it is important to say that um, the Judeo-Christian tradition is more important for this country than any one church. Um, when I argue for the public importance of the Judeo-Christian tradition in policy making, in legislation, I am not talking about the privilege of this or that church. I mean, that is a separate argument. Um, but without that, Without that, we are left with opinion polls. We are left with a kind of naive consequentialism uh, that will not, in the end, respect the human person, particularly when the human person is weakest. At the earliest stages of life, at the later stages of life, and even uh, when, for some reason or the other, we find ourselves in a situation where our natural faculties may be greatly weakened through disease. Uh, the Liverpool Care Pathway events uh, should show us uh, that we cannot trust utilitarianism to respect the human person. I hope that lesson has been learned. Thank you very much for your attention.